So I wanted to bring up the, uh, the the noble method. What is the noble method? And that the wise person, the stream enterer, has attained mm. or discovered, so to speak. Mm. He's understood what the method is mm. for the cultivation of Nibbana. He's understood it. What is that method that now he must exercise mm. so that he can cultivate and develop that Nibbana which he knows? So what is that noble method? It's not the watching, counting of the breath or watching your feet mm. or repeating a mantra. So what is it? So here's a sutta. I'll, I'll put it in the description of the sutta. Okay. Um, and what is the noble method that he has clearly seen and thoroughly penetrated with wisdom that he has understood? Here, householder, the noble disciple attends properly that Yoni saw Manisikara. Mm -hmm. Says he, he attends closely to dependence origination with this. But it's own part. This is. Yeah. So that's the that's it. But it's mm. on doesn't matter how differently you find it described in the suttas, it's always described upon the same principle as the Buddha himself said, which is with this, this is. Both are present, both are there, the relationship of determination. So the reason why I'm saying that is because There is a certainly quite established contemporary idea of Patitsampada being an explanation of rebirth and so on. You can check out other talks on the on the on the website about Patitsampada, but in brief here it's actually a principle of attending, knowing how to attend things properly. That's what Patitsampada is. Seeing the, the presently enduring necessary condition for the presently enduring necessary state. So the present, the enduring necessary condition for your craving, on account of which you suffer, is a presently enduring feeling, for example. Mm -hmm. So with this, this is. With this, this is the, the problem. With this, this is the... the, the Patija Samupada with the grain, as, as it was described often. So then by seeing the necessary condition, you get to uproot the problem that is. So the problem of suffering, problem of aging, sickness, birth, and so on. But it doesn't mean you need to go through all the fa 12 factors or 16 factors or sometimes 8 factors. It means you need to see the principle with clarity mm -hmm. and then it will... that seeing the principle with clarity results in uprooting the asalas. And the, the exercising of that principle... Is, is the method. Is the method. Yeah. Which means it's... How, how can you exercise the principle of right attention? only by finding out what that principle is yeah and that's what i mean like if you you if this method will then result in understanding the clarity of this passion this enchantment and so on but you can't have a method of oh these are the prescribed set of motions and things you do they will then magically arrive at understanding yes yeah it's it's usually interpreted the other way around mm. oh, i watch my breath then i yeah. get the understanding yeah yeah and then and then the, the basically the work is done for me yeah. through that understanding that I haven't like and even with in mundane terms the only way to develop understanding is to to try well keep making effort to understand which means you need to know what needs to be understood be clear about it clarify it more question it and then you might arrive at understanding even in lay terms like if not Dhamma practice um, if if mm -hmm. if person is not interested in down practice, just lay terms, when it comes to understanding, there is no prescribed sets of just do this, write this down, then look that look at that, and it will result in understanding. And you know that even in education. You can be presented with information, you can memorize information, you can learn how information works. That doesn't mean you understood the principle of it. And that's the difference between good students and bad students. Or like students that excel are the ones who actually start understanding things as opposed to just memorize, have it there, parrot it out, and move on. And there is no method of that mechanical nature 
mm. that can result in un understanding automatic is just impossible. So when it comes to Dhamma, it's even more so, because like the understanding is the liberation. Thoroughly understanding the nature of experience means you are an arahant. So, but it's the same understanding, by the way. The principle of understanding is still the same. It's not somehow we abandon the reason, uh, rational thought of what understanding is when it comes to practice of Dhamma. And then understanding is something mystical. If it's mystical, it's not understood. As simple as that. That's the definition of mysticism. Unclear. Ambiguous. Mystique. Mm -hmm. so, so the point is, when it comes to like somebody who wants to practice the Dhamma, in order to develop the right view, uh, you need to make the effort to understand what the principle of that is. That method, principle. yeah. So if you understand then, ah, that, that uh, dependent origination, or whichever way it's translated, means you got the right view. Mm -hmm. but And you also means you, you, you know the Four Noble Truths. And it also means you know the way out of suffering. That's the thing, you can, you can have that, uh, the idea... Mm. Of that, you can even you can have the right idea yeah. of what right view is. Exactly, You're very close. And but now that, that doesn't mean you need to actually. You need to have the right idea, because mm. if you don't have the right idea, how can you then understand the principle behind the idea? But obviously, you can have the right idea, but if you never make the effort to understand the principle behind it, you won't understand it either. So you need to have the right idea, and then you need to make the effort to understand the principle. Now you might ask, so how do I know when I understood it? Mm. Is it still just an idea or understanding is sort of taking place? Well, you would know if you are unable to suffer. That's, that's the thing. You can have the right idea, but you're not going to have the fruits of that right idea immediately. No, no, no. That's the no. thing. So you don't know, is this no. the right idea? Well, it's the most right idea that I could possibly think. It's the closest think. that it's I can think of to be right, yeah. So now what? So you have but to that's not enough. Now what? Okay, now I'm clear about Patitsampada, let's move on. Okay, now if you're truly clear about Patitsampada, about the idea of dependent origination, you would be unable to suffer amidst suffering. Is that the case? You have to ask yourself honestly and transparently. Am I unable to suffer amidst things that used to make me suffer and, 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 and trigger emotions and so on? Now I just am, am unable to suffer. Not like I prevent myself from experiencing these things or try to hide away or explain them to myself oh it's it's you know it's impermanent it's not a big deal no no am i how much am i affected by it in the first place that should be a measure of whether you're progressing rightly or not mm -hmm. because if you are understanding particular by the four noble truths means you you will be unable to be affected as much as before and when you start recognizing then the immediately confidence comes ah i am unable to be disturbed not because i'm trying to hide myself away from the disturbance it's simply because I'm basically I'm above the disturbance on account of my understanding. Yeah, how does my understanding relate to my suffering? Does it not even work? relate? Because then, oh, how does it relate? Let me figure uh -huh. it out how it relates. Like, is my understanding of these are these ideas that I have? Are they freeing me? Are they preventing me from being able to be disturbed by the suffering in the first place? Regardless of whether I know the connection between the two or not. That's what I mean. How much can I suffer? And if you're understanding things, that should be diminishing. You can't say exactly to what, to what the quantify the extent, but you'll know that you are less disturbed. Disturbance persists less and less. Arises less frequently. But how do you know that it is the right idea when you have no results? Of that. Well, yeah, you so don't. You have to. That's where the faith comes in. Do I in. suffer anymore? Yeah, exactly. Am I, is there possibly? Well, maybe. That's why we keep saying that. That's why it's impossible to become a sotapanna accidentally. To get the right view accidentally, like oh, I just done this and wow, now I know, because you have no criteria, you have no immediate measure. So why would you then be doing that thing when you can't even discern it as something to be done, let alone keep repeating it? Without the apparent but result. You, 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 yeah, keep, why would you keep repeating that yeah. right view? Because you need to repeat it. Yeah. That idea that you clarify once, you need to repeat maybe a million of times, depending on where you are at internally. But you need to keep repeating it. So the only reason you'll be repeating it is out of faith. Out of sufficient faith in that like intellectual recognition that this might be closest to the truth. The only way to verify that is to commit and start repeating it. Mm -hmm. 
and re-drilling. That's the training. He trains himself thus. I will not regard this as mine. I will not regard this as permanent. He on and on. Not like once or twice or three times. Who knows how many times? Well, the Buddha says how many times. For seven years, seven months, se who knows? But basically, you just you can't do it. I'll do it this much. You just have to yeah. do it until the results take place. Yeah, but he also he gives different ways to do that. Yeah, yeah sure. But so it's doing the same principle, yeah. doing the same thing. In, but you can do it, and then that's, that's where Satipatthana comes in. Yes. You yeah. can either attend to you the body. You can do it on the basis of the body, feelings. the principle. You can do it on the basis of feelings, on the basis of the mind, on mm. the basis of the thoughts. Yeah, you can watch it. You can... Yeah, attend to the breath yeah. but it's the principle so you're I'm looking sensation. for so it's yeah. like when you practice mindfulness to the body you know, oh, I'm watching sensations and that's, that's just observing sense of touch sensations of touch mm -hmm. perception of touch sensations through my legs and back that's literally perception of touch nothing else so somehow perception of touch results in this transcendental experience of understanding no it's just mechanically chasing for the novelty experiences that's what you're most not, people's you're meditation is you're not exercising your right view you just you're not exercising right view because you don't have it and you're not going to have it because you're not looking to find it and you find it where you understand the principle of, of Patitsa and Pada mm -hmm. because that's when Ananda who, who you know who had the right view for like over 20 years when he was sitting that time with the Buddha and said I mean it's amazing like but it's the clearest thing possible it's right there in your face with this this is it's just it's so easy it's, it's always there and the Buddha said no don't say that it's easy like it's easy for you because you've been basically you understood it 20 years ago and ever since you've just been fortifying it. But it's because of that very thing, of that Patichsumpada principle that people don't understand. That's why all the eons of suffering and samsaras mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. else. So in other words, it is so, it's the closest thing to you, and that's why it's invisible. People are not used to looking so closely, so to speak, not attending so closely. And when I say attending closely, I don't mean attending to the particular details, mm -hmm. but more like, wait, I'm attending to this on account of what? What is the peripheral of this currently arisen Persp attention? Perspective on your attention. What's the perspective on, on account of... Yeah, what's the perspective on things that I'm currently attending to? Mm -hmm. So like, uh, you're feeling, for example. Oh, I'm, I'm feeling upset. Oh. Okay, so you can now choose the direction of attending the upset and what has seemingly caused it, what you perceived at the time, who said what, when, what you should do next time, how you should decide it. All of that is already within the context that you're affected by the upset, it's unpleasant, and now you're trying to get rid of displeasure. Because mm -hmm. you can then stop. Wait, I, how many times I chased down um, psychology, psychologizing of why I got upset, I should have done this, should have done that next time I'll do this, all in order to prevent that upset happening to you. Or you can choose to attend, wait, what if I don't give in to trying to get rid of the pain of upset, but see what else is there as a necessary basis for that upset to take place. That's now the different direction. That's direction of broader context on account of currently arisen upset, which then starts including your need to get rid of the upset because it's unpleasant, which you won't be seeing if you just give in and, and follow the thought of, of upset down the line wherever it takes you. So the context is kind of rediscovered on a broader terms. Because there's always a context. Even when you choose to psychologize, the context is trying to get rid of the pain. But you're unaware of it. So there is no limit to how much you can develop context rightly. But it doesn't matter how much you develop the context or how much you lose the context. The principle of with context, this is the direction, stays the same. With this, this is. So you just want to reverse the order, so to speak, and not go with the grain, as the Buddha would say. Context of upset means get rid of the upset for an untrained mind. So you learn that that doesn't work. You use your intelligence, your reason to see that that doesn't work. So what if I try the opposite? So context of upset need to get rid of the upset, restrain the need to get rid of the upset within the context of upset. So you start swimming against the, the, the grain, against the current. And then the more you do that, the more familiar then you become with the context of upset that you were blindly just trying to get rid of. And then you realize, well, wait, the only reason I'm upset, the only reason I suffer on account of this upset is because I'm trying to get rid of the upset. Mm -hmm. out of my view that this must be removed that's the perspective that you that's the perspective you gain mm -hmm. if you start swimming upstream mm -hmm. but for that you need that restraint obviously you need faith because you have no verification that upstream will guarantee you results of freedom from upset 
But that faith, how much of that faith you require is determined of how much of your intellectual capacity and reasoning you have, on account of which you understood that this is most likely to make sense. That's like, hmm, induce certain, on a base of reasoning, induce like a, as a premise, which is the safest one. You can't know for sure beforehand. That's, that's the, the insufficiency of reason. By itself, you cannot reason the extent of why you should repeat the reason. Mm -hmm. So you need to have faith that your reasoning was accurate enough to keep repeating it, and then you get the results, that, that the direct results of repetition of reason, not just once reason, twice reason, three times reason. Like repeating the same reflection and drilling it and drilling it and making it persist. That's why that, that, that Dhamma, if you do it, is beyond reason. Not because it's unreasonable, but because it, you need to reason and rationally recognize what is for your welfare, what is good, what should be like heed, heeded to and, and, and done. And then you need to repeat it. And you can't reason that. If you're like a pure logical mind that just reasons, reasons accurately, you can't reason why you should repeat this same reflection, same reasoning for seven years. Because there is no immediate result that can then give you a feedback for your reason. But if you do it out of faith, without sacrificing your reason, which as we made apparent, it's actually necessary. So you don't sacrifice the reason, you even like take it even further and just keep repeating the same reason. Out of faith, you get the result of the right view. Mm -hmm. How long? Well, that's where the faith comes in. In the same sense, you come to see a doctor, you tried so many doctors, so now you heard about such and such doctor and you haven't tried that treatment, and based on kind of trial and error that you learn on account of trying other doctors, it, you sort of induce a conclusion that there is a good chance that he might be right. It doesn't fit into anything wrong that you've done before, seems to be the opposite, so you can go and you kind of, you can reason that it makes sense. But that in itself will not cure you. You need to go and start doing what the doctor prescribed. And you cannot reason that that will be the right thing to do. You can reason that it's going to be the least likely thing that's wrong, mm. but you need to start doing it to see whether it actually cures you or not. And that's exactly what. And when it cures you, the fact that you're now healthy, cured, has not been... A, you haven't obtained it by mere reasoning alone, as the Buddha said. Dhamma cannot be obtained by mere reasoning alone. That's what Ataka Vachara means. It's beyond mere reason. As in you use the reason, and then you keep repeating the reason, and then you get cured, and now you are, you'd have not arrived there. It wouldn't be true to say, oh, I arrived at this cure simply by reasoning that that's the cure. No, that's what brought you to the cure. Clear, authentic, transparent reasoning. But then repetition of that cure is what cure you. Repetition of the reason. Repetition the right of the reason. reason. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, re like, you, you reason the principle, the, the necessity of craving for suffering, the, like, did you have a say in, in how your feelings arise? No. You just resist them or want them. Why is that? So use your intellect, your reason, to clarify reflection of it. And now you get a sense of, okay, so when the feeling arises, if it's pleasant, I should not lean towards it. If it's unpleasant, I should not lean away from it. What if I make the effort now to maintain that as a context, as a reflection, as a state of mind that I arrived at on account of reasoning it rightly. Mm -hmm. And if you do maintain it, you will approve the, you're swimming basically against the craving. And when you reach the sufficient point of diminishing of craving, you will then recognize it and that's where you ver verified your reason for yourself. Right. So the party. Yeah. That's yes. why oh, nobody can be my guide anymore. Because no now you have discovered the principle with this, this is, and that is your guide. There's no doubt anymore. But, oh, you cannot stupid. doubt that. You cannot doubt that. So that that is a noble method. The closest you can say to a method is trying to under, uh, for understanding is trying to understand. Trying to understand what? Good question. Read the suttas. You'll see what you need to understand. And then repeating that. And then keep doing it. As I said. The measure of understanding is not when you get a clear idea about understanding, it's when you cannot suffer yeah. anymore, when you have no passion left anymore. That's the measure of the extent of your understanding. That's the, the, the Panya Vimuti Arahant, the type of 
practice what type basically certain people arrive at arahantship through as the Buddha would say resolve upon wisdom so literally you have such a clarity of insight and wisdom but you haven't done it long enough to uproot the asavas in you like Sotapanna, Sakadgami, Anagami they haven't done it long enough so some people would just stick to it like you know with a bit of they know out of faith now that they have confirmed so they're confident that if they stick to these reflections this kind of practice it will result in uprooting greed aversion delusion because they've already seen it for themselves to some extent but then the other type is who would like emphasize that uh, rational clarity of that principle and then literally make a determination upon maintaining it at any expense at every other expense they just maintain the context of with this this is or any other aspect yeah. of that wisdom no, no, no. So resolved upon that wisdom, right. long enough, you are an arahant. Right. So resolve upon the clarity of that idea, long enough, you will be an arahant. They, they maintain mindfulness exactly. of that. Through that view. idea. Yeah. Yeah. They maintain sense restraint through that idea. Samadhi through that idea. Mm-hmm. Well, maintaining that idea is compo- composing, yeah. the, keeping yeah. that idea composed, which is a definition of samadhi. So that's mm-hmm. that's what it means Dhamma is beyond reason. Not without reason. Yeah. Beyond reason means, More. as the Buddha said, not uh, obtainable by me by reason alone or by mere reasoning. But often people will jump into conclusion: Ah, the Dhamma cannot be reasoned. Thus, Dhamma is unreasonable. So make it mystical and ambiguous. But you just need to read the suttas, and you see it can very much be reasoned. The Buddha would often say, well, if the other Brahmins and ascetics ask you this, you should then in return ask them that. Well, if that's your premise, why is this your conclusion? And so it's just pure, clear, authentic reasoning. Not because you just look for faults so or you want to defend yourself like mm-hmm. irrationally, but because you rationally understand the place where they come from and you're rationally understanding why it's inadequate. Like when, when giants would claim they're omniscient, they see and hear, they, they see and know all the time. And the Buddha would say, well, if somebody claims that, you should ask them, why are they followers of that teaching who see and hear, who see and know everything all the time? Why do they get into accidents? Why do they fall into pits? Why do they get attacked by dogs? Because they would have foreseen these things and they would have avoided them. Everybody would avoid those things. And then they try to say, well, no, it's because, uh, you know, they choose to go, whatever. Like They try to, like now, irrationally rationalize it. Mm-hmm. So, do you read the suttas and it's very much reasonable, but that doesn't mean that mere reason is enough. That's why when uh, that uh, logician read the suttas, uh, Nirvita mentions it, he said, oh, this is just mere tautology. The whole suttas are just tautological statements. And that is true if you never, uh, if you never think there is anything more than just getting the idea of understanding that stands for understanding. So they are the tautological ideas. Like if you're free from craving, you will not be a victim to craving anymore. Right. So you get that on the level of idea. But if you have no faith now to assume that there is maybe more to that idea, as in more to be developed, you'll stop there. And that's what like a person who puts reason and only reason as the sole criteria can never arrive at Dhamma. Because yes, the idea of it is perfectly reasonable and self-explanatory almost. So what else is missing there? It's the repetition of that idea that misses. Because your experience is still experience of craving. With craving, with passion, with greed, with aversion, with delusion. So you have the idea that absence of craving means you're not liable to the pressure of craving anymore, which means you will not suffer on account of it. Okay, so now the idea that I have, clear idea of craving is to be abandoned, I must actually cultivate bhavana. I must keep repeating it. Not just get the idea and be and take it for granted that now that has been completely understood. Which is what a person, as I said, who puts ra- rationalizing and thinking first and foremost, can never arrive at. That's why they can never commit to any degree of faith. Even if it's literally a faith to a doctor. Nobody's asking you to... like The problem with other religions is when they ask for faith, they ask it at the expense of reason. So it's like, don't, um, just don't question this, have faith, I abandon your reason. Even if so, accept contradictions, accept mystic, mysticism, accept every other nonsense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is not the faith we speak about. It's the faith of, wait, 
I am ill, I recognize that much. I am bothered by suffering, bothered by greed, aversion, delusion. So you need to place faith in a doctor to some extent, otherwise you will not take the medicine because you don't trust it. And if you think that that's the ultimate criteria of not trusting anything and everything, well, you're free to do so, but then you will remain liable to greed, aversion, delusion that you kind of recognize as uh, are a problem that must be addressed, a form of illness. Mm -hmm. Of course, people who are like purely and, and, and only reasonable and rational, they'll never even accept greed, aversion, delusion to be the problem. They'll just reason it out. But the reasoning cannot free you from suffering. Mere reasoning cannot free you from suffering. So if you're truly honest with yourself, doesn't matter how much, how great your reasoning and rationalizing is, when you suffer, you realize that is a problem. And again, you can use the reasoning to realize that suffering is a problem. But most people, when it comes to suffering, would use the reasoning to like deal with suffering. Right, not look right, at it for what it is so that's why as we spoke before you need reasoning like objective thinking clarity of that rational thought paired with existential attitude and existential attitude means existence is a problem suffering is a problem and then you use the rational uh, thought and your reasoning to unravel how and why this uh, existence is a problem and then you would. Well, it's a problem because you're not in control, because you're subject to greed, aversion, delusion, you're subject to death, accidents, sickness, aging, unavoidable, and those things are unpleasant. So you're subject to suffering. Your reason is subject to suffering. So how do I uproot this? How do I cure myself from that problem? Not by abandoning reason and pretending, ah, you know, the universe, universal energy, that's all I need to tap into and I'm done. No. By using the reason to find the right doctor and then by using the reason to keep applying the instructions from the right doctor. And who is the right doctor? Well, you have no criteria for that, as we said before, but you can use your reason to determine who is the least likely going to be the wrong doctor. And then start applying it, trial and error, and then you see. Is this diminishing the suffering? Is this diminishing liability to be disturbed? I'm not sure. Well, maybe I should apply more. No, well, hold on. If you're not sure, make the effort to understand why you're not yeah, sure. Yeah. Is it because you haven't applied enough? Yes. Is it because it's inadequate? Oh, now you discover a contradiction in the doctor's instruction. Mm. Ah, that's why. Change the doctor. Or you discover contradiction in your understanding of doctor's instruction. Change your understanding. Yeah. Upgrade it. Clarify more. You can, you can ask your doctor, why should I take this medicine? Oh, well, just... Yeah. Well, Just people do. It. Why should I do that? Well, you like I can't answer that for you. Mm. I can tell you why you well, should do it, it but it that will that cannot be the reason why you should do it. The only mm. reason why you should do it is if you start seeing your existence as a problem. That's the reason why you should do it. And again, then you question: What am I asked to do? Am I asked to abandon my reason, to abandon mm. my intellect? To, to, to sacrifice my, my basically rational thought and commit to this ridiculous, like just mere faith alone, like salvation no not at all i'm actually asked to use the reason and turn it against the existence to the point of like revealing that underlying nature of existence which is nature of suffering and then you will not need any other proof why you should do it you will recognize suffering is a problem we are liable to this it's it's perilous it's dangerous it's actually worth escaping from but even that, you need to have reason and faith to arrive at that mundane conclusion that you should practice the Dhamma. So that's why, yeah, you are fortunate if you already have faith to practice the Dhamma, but that in itself, oh yes, I have faith that that's the best doctor. But are you now reasonably applying his instruction? Mm. No, I just hope through my admiration of doctor and my, my belief that he's the greatest doctor, I'll somehow be cured. No. Mm -hmm. So the faith type, when the Buddha talks about, is the t type that has a lot of faith, so he doesn't necessarily question the doctor to the same extent. But it doesn't mean he's unreasonable, even the faith type. Because you still need reason to apply the principle of the right method. Yeah, yeah. With this, this is. He gets a sufficient amount of reason. And exactly. He applies it. Exactly. So he gets faith that compensates for maybe slightly lesser extent of reason, but there is still reason and reasonable attention and recognition of these things. Mm. Otherwise, how mm. can you apply them? Mm. Mm. Well, you don't know what you're applying. You exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying, like being overly rational, as in never having any 
any degree of faith in regard to it and seeing that there is maybe a, a longer a greater perspective at play or being like irrational basically not rational enough which is when you're mystical when it's just when you make statements oh it's just like this this is it knowing and now it's the present moment and just be here now in the present what have you understood there you're just parroting basically the mantra is there understanding of the principle behind an account which you can't suffer? Or is just stop thinking, stop thinking, be here now, just stop thinking, just present moment, at present moment? So you're denying even the basic reason there. Hmm. So that's what I mean. Not being obtainable by me, mere reasoning alone doesn't mean you need to become unreasonable. Needs to. Needs, hmm. You need to use the reason to the point of then you get the results that come from beyond reason. And what's beyond reason? Well, it's the repetition of reason is beyond reason. So what, you won't repeat the reason if you don't see the point of reason, such as mysticism. Stop thinking, be here now. And you won't repeat the reason if you never abandon your reason as a starting point to the point of never allow any degree of faith in regard to it. Faith means what you put first, basically. Like, I, I have a criteria of what the right doctor is, what the, what the right doctor isn't, but the fact is I'm not cured. I'm still sick. But on account of my criteria being put first as fore and foremost, I will not commit to any doctor's instruction. So your own reason impeded you to go beyond reason. But if you realize, well, I have nothing to lose because I'm not sacrificing reason, I'm not being asked to do unwholesome things. What if I just for this, you know, give a benefit of doubt to the doctor that is least likely to be wrong based on my own reasoning and then follow his prescription and I'll see if I'm getting better or not. I have nothing to lose. Now, if I ask you, on account of following my medicine, go and do these hideous acts and these crazy things, but believe you'll be right, then you use your reason. That's why what the Buddha referred to, like the, the mundane right view. Recognizing there is suffering. There is a possibility of not suffering. There is, there is action. There are results of action. There is the extent of things that I cannot reasonably know. I cannot reason next life or previous life. But I can also not reason the belief of there is no next life and there is no previous life. Mm -hmm. So you like basically the mundane right view is the, uh, the transparency of reason. When your reason is not used to like um, justify greed, aversion, delusion, but when your reason is self-honest, mm -hmm. that's what mundane right view is. Honest, like I know only to this extent. I don't know that extent. That doesn't mean that. I can now justifiably accept a view and belief for the extent that I don't know. You just need to recognize reasonably that I don't know this much. But then you also start asking, well, is it important to know this much? What is important to know? Mm -hmm. Then the inevitable question would be, uh, why do I want to know that? It's unpleasant for me, the lack of, the lack of proof, the lack of belief. It makes me feel anxious, not knowing. Ah. So that is the factual reality that you can reasonably discern and accept. The extent mm. of not knowing certain things makes me feel anxious. What is the next conclusion? I am subject to anxiety. Because if I am truly my own, in control of myself, nothing could cause anxiety in me. Yet there are things that can cause anxiety mm. in me. So will I use now my reason to cover up that anxiety and jump into a belief that there is no next life, we all die, we're just elements? Or will I use my my reason to basically negate the reason and just develop this view that everything will work itself out and everything will be fine and we are all heading to heaven? Or will I use the mundane right view, the right reason and say, I am subject to anxiety. That is the, net, the, the hard truth. Whichever way I take it, the first truth is I am subject to anxiety. I am subject to suffering. Things are not in my control. And if you keep your reason on that transparent level, self-transparent level, you will look for the way out. You will just, existence is the problem. Craving is the problem. Suffering is the problem. That's what Buddha said. Like Suffering, uh, becoming self-aware of suffering, rightly, can only result in two things. Madness, losing your mind on a kind of anxiety, or noble search. As in, okay, who can help me with this problem? Mm -hmm. who, where is a medicine that can basically cure me from this? And that's, that's the necessary attitude for the right Dhamma practice. Yeah, that anxiety is a... Uh, it's a measure. 
Because that's why people jump into beliefs and faith mm. and believe in next lives unreasonably and disbelieve in, in next lives unreasonably. Because yeah, yeah. of the pain, the discomfort they're yeah, trying to get rid the, of. Actually, the reality is that you can, again, use your reason to like uncover is either I believe or not, I don't believe, I do it because it displeases me. It's unpleasant. Yeah, yeah, that's why. The basis. Yeah. So, uh, rationally, you discern that you keep acting out of discomfort that you are subjected to. You try to get rid of pain. That is your ultimate value, to not suffer. Whether you pursue the world or try to get rid of the world, you do it because you don't want to suffer. Ah, but if your recognition then stays on that level, then you actually are a step closer to understand the nature of suffering and obviously the escape from it mm -hmm. in a way that will not require a belief ultimately and for its own sake. Beliefs, that's bel beliefs that sacrifice reason are wrong. But beliefs that make you keep it, keep repeating that which you reason out rightly, that's a good belief. That will actually make you do the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, faith is necessary. That's why the power of faith. But faith, faith is also dangerous because if you haven't reasoned clearly enough, you can place it in something very wrong. Yeah. And that is the, the peril of human situation. You cannot know you are right until you commit to that which seems right and then keep applying it until you get the right results. Which is yeah. and ten years down. But the again, line. you can use then your reason to recognize that well, either way, you're subjected to suffering, subjected to anxiety, subjected to problem. Yeah. So fundamentally, you have nothing to lose. Yeah, yeah. You're already. Yeah. So you better apply place. something, and make some effort to trial and error, and hope you have enough time in this life to do the work. <laughs>